everyone. This is Susan Gerbeck from the GSW. There we go. We just waited for Susan to say hello. Hello, Susan. What we're watching here in YouTube is a video made from an audio file. This is a pure audio excerpt of an appearance Susan made on some podcast, Skepticality, I believe, and it's been made into a YouTube video to make it more accessible. What we're going to do in this video is learn how to do this. We'll take an audio file uh, that has no video and convert it into a YouTube video, adding images and video to give the listener something to look at while they're listening. And where possible, the video or images will be meaningful. There'll be references or examples of whatever the audio is talking about at that time. And on the occasion that we can't think of something meaningful, uh, the video or the uh, image may be simply decorative. So we're going to walk through the process of producing a YouTube video version of an audio file. Here we go. By the way, the file that we're going to produce is that exact video that we just looked at. That was the finished product. Now we'll work through the process of building that. Here's what we're going to cover. We'll talk about making sure you have permission to do this at all. That's going to seem a little bureaucratic, but it's an important consideration. I'll review what software I use for this job and mention that there are many other packages you could use, but I'm going to stick with what I know. We'll review and prepare the audio file, looking for common errors, correctable and uncorrectable, and we'll talk about the pros and cons of stereo versus mono and how to tell what you're dealing with. Then we'll make a plan using a transcript of the audio uh, to figure out what kinds of images we will need. We'll go and get those images from a variety of sources, again paying attention to permissions, and we'll edit and manipulate the images so that they fit our needs. Then we'll put the video together, dropping the images into their appropriate place in the timeline, and scaling them, shifting them, and adding a variety of motion effects, because after all this is a video and things should move. Then we're going to add some background music and edit it to have it start audibly at the beginning and be audible at the end, but fade into an inconspicuous background during the middle. Then we'll switch into a different editor and pay a little final attention to the quality of the auto audio, doing some edits so that uh, we have a pleasant sounding audio file to listen to. We'll go back into our video editor and export everything as a video file suitably formatted for YouTube. And finally, we will upload to YouTube and do a few final adjustments there. That's the process we're going to go through. Come on along. You're taking someone else's audio file and you're going to combine it with someone else's images and possibly other videos. So you're taking other people's property and you're producing what's called a derived work. There may be copyright issues with doing that. YouTube is very careful that it doesn't become a platform for distributing copyright violations, so you need to be really careful that you're sure you have permission for what you produce. Otherwise, YouTube will remove your video and possibly ban you as a publisher. Here are the sorts of things you need to think about. First, you need permission to use the audio. Presumably, you'll need the permission of whoever's voice is on the recording, uh, in the case of this example we're working on now, Susan's. And if you got that recording off of a podcast, you should also have the permission of the producer of the podcast, because the audio is their property. Now, they will almost certainly give you permission, especially if you offer to credit their show or provide a link to them, but don't assume. You need to ask. Next, the visuals that you use, images and videos, are someone's property and you need to have permission to use them. The easiest way to accomplish that is to restrict yourself to using public domain images and videos. And we'll talk uh, in a few minutes about some good ways, easy ways to get such things, things like Wikimedia Commons. If you are using images that are copyright property of someone, then you need to make sure you get their permission. And it's important to understand who owns an image. If you're looking at, for example, a portrait of a person, it is often the case that the property is not owned by the person in the portrait, but rather by the photographer that took the picture. So if I find a beautiful, professionally done portrait of Susan, 
Susan's permission isn't enough. I need to have the photographer's permission unless he has given to Susan the right to give away such permission. This all sounds very bureaucratic, but you need to do these things or your video will be removed. As we said, the safe way to avoid these problems is to use all and only public domain content, which you can get from a variety of sources, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Finally, and this needs to be said, if you do happen to ask permission of someone to use their audio or their images and they say no, well, no means no, and you need to go and find a different source for your content. Now you can get into a debate about First Amendment rights and fair use and other such things if you feel like it, uh, fill your boots. But I wouldn't. I will use material only that I am sure I have permission to use and that's my advice to you. So let's start by talking about software. There are a lot of different ways to approach this job. Um, I'm going to be demonstrating just one, the software package that I use which is the Adobe Creative Cloud Suite. This is sort of the gold standard for this kind of work, and it contains a comprehensive suite of programs that work well together and are very powerful. Now, it's a bit expensive, and frankly, it's probably more than you can afford if you just plan to produce a few YouTube videos for fun. For me, I had it anyway because I use it for other purposes, uh, photography, graphic art, image editing and so on, and so it was a natural choice. Specifically, I use uh, Adobe Premiere Pro for the main video editing job. We'll be seeing us spend a lot of time inside that package. That's where we will put down the audio file, lay out images uh, along a timeline, uh, add special effects, motion, and so on. Next we use Adobe Audition to edit the audio. We'll use it to clean up any problematic audio files that we may have, and then we'll use it at the very end of the process to do a final polishing on the audio quality of the product. And finally, the other programs in the Adobe Suite are quite useful on occasion. I use Photoshop to edit images, tasks such as uh, cropping images to shape, resizing them, removing small bits of content that I don't want in a screenshot that I intend to use and so on. I'll use Illustrator or InDesign to create illustrations or blocks of text on occasion. And stepping out of the Adobe Suite, I like to use the Google Chrome browser to actually visit the web pages that we talk about because there's a wonderful plugin available for Google Chrome called full screen page capture that makes it very easy to get a multi page uh, web page captured in a single graphic file which is very useful. Now you could do everything that I'm going to be showing you here with other software much of it free. Uh, hopefully this video will give you the general idea and you can figure out how to do the equivalent in the tools that you have or go research free tools. And I would invite anybody who has recommendations on free tools to mention them in the comments. If you do use the Adobe Suite, this video is not a tutorial on how to use those tools, and they're complex. So I'm assuming you already know how to use them, or that you're going to go and find that out by using the online help or one of the many good tutorials that are available. If you're trying to figure out how to do something specific in one of these tools, I recommend you just do a search in YouTube, and it's amazing what kind of guidance you can find there for free. So let's uh, get started. So the first thing we're going to do is do a quick review of the audio file that we'll be working with. This is the audio file of Susan's podcast about the Perry DeAngelis webpage. So we're going to give this a quick listen and uh, also inspect it visually. And make sure the file is in good shape. I have had the experience of spending several days working on YouTubifying a audio file only to discover that the file was incomplete or had some dreadful error in it towards the end. So I've made the habit of always giving the file a complete once over before beginning. So let's uh, arrange to listen to and visually inspect this file by dragging and dropping it here onto Adobe Audition. 
Now Adobe Audition is kind of overkill as a simple audio player, but it's actually quite good for this purpose. Here's the file. Uh, it's quite good for this purpose for a couple of reasons. Obviously I can play the file. I'll click the play button and uh, I'm listening to the file. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW project. One of the I won't continue that right now. And it's got good playback controls. I can uh, fast forward, rewind quite easily using the mouse controls down here and their keyboard's equivalent. So it's, it's a very convenient program for quickly scanning through a file. And of course you can also do that visually. The waveform editor here is a great way to get a sense of what's going on in the file. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, this is a stereo file. So this is the left and right channels. And the lines here represent the volume of sound in the file. So you can see that the file is pretty much a constant volume throughout, which is good for somebody talking. There's a very loud section in the center here. That'll be interesting. We'll go find out what that is. Stated she can drain people's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide, shouting, Drain me! Okay, so that's just Susan talking loudly. Nothing wrong with that. But it could have easily been, you know, a a plate falling on the floor or something. You can also see gaps in the files. I'll just zoom in here. There's a, a gap. That's interesting. I wonder what that period of silence is. If you know your skeptic history... Nothing special, but again, a gap can indicate a problem in the file, like the battery in somebody's microphone beginning to fail. So the visual aid, I find, helps me to find my way around the file. Plus I can use uh, what Adobe Audition calls markers to set locations in the file uh, like bookmarks if I need to come back and continue the review later. So I find the thing quite useful. Uh, finally I'll mention that the waveform editor, this thing here, can be extremely useful in detecting certain types of problems in a file. Now I don't have the problem here, but I'm going to uh, quickly zip over to a different file. I'm just going to move this folder over a bit. I have this file hidden on the desktop here which I will drop into Audition. And what I've done in this file is artificially create a problem called clipping. This is what I would see if I received an audio file that someone had their microphone volume set way too high. So because they've got their volume set too high, the tops of these peaks have crashed into the limit of what the microphone can record. So we've lost information here. I say I don't know where the tops of those peaks should be because they've hit infinity and that will cause a, a very unpleasant sound, a distortion when and became what we now know as the New England when trying to play this thing back and that's not recoverable. That information is gone. It's like if you have a digital camera and you severely overexpose your picture. You know, you've probably overexposed the sky, for example. Well, the information in that overexposed part is gone because the brightness is simply set to its maximum value. So this is a, a terribly damaged file and I'd have to make a decision at this point whether I can live with the distorted audio or whether this is something that needs to be thrown away and re-recorded because this cannot be repaired. And in this visual waveform this is the, the easiest way to quickly see that this is going on. So what we'll do, or what we would do, is using this thing, uh, I'll listen to the entire audio um, and just make sure that it's okay, that it sounds good, and get my first general sense of what's going on. Just going to put the other uh, file, the actual file, back up here again. Because we've talked about giving the file a listen for quality problems. So let's talk about sound quality a little bit more. This is primarily an audio production here. The, the images that we're adding are to enhance the audio, but this is really about making it more convenient for someone to listen to this audio content. So the audio needs to be good quality. <clears throat> we certainly need to make sure that we don't make it worse when we edit it and add it to our video production. And if we find small correctable problems, we'd actually like to make it better. However, remember that this is probably going to end up being played through somebody's computer. This isn't a musical performance, uh, unless it is, unless you're YouTubifying a musical performance. This is probably somebody talking. Your typical listener is probably listening through cheap computer speakers or earbuds. So we want to make the audio as good as we can, but also be prepared to settle for good enough. 
Finally, though, remember that you cannot produce good audio by editing bad audio. If the file you have to work with isn't of a basic level of quality, there's nothing you can do. So as your skills develop, you can repair more and more complex problems with audio, but I certainly suggest you start with a good quality audio file so that you don't get frustrated and you can focus your development on learning the skills of assembling the video and not having to immediately jump into audio repair. A word about the kind of problems you might encounter and what you can fix. Things that are common and easy to fix are uh, small background, highly regular noises. For example, it's quite common to encounter a hiss uh, from a nearby computer fan or air or even just from uh, low quality microphone cables and so on. It's also very common to encounter a low frequency hum, like a 60 hertz hum from wall current or 100, 120 hertz hum that might be uh, from a, a nearby air conditioner or a computer fan. Or another kind of problem that is easily correctable is if the volume is simply too low. The gain wasn't set high enough on the microphone, high enough that there's a signal there, but you'd like it to be a little louder. Uh, and uh, clicks, um, dropped items, you know, uh, pen clicking on the table if your uh, broadcaster is nervously ticking away with a pen. So trivial and simple sounds like that are correctable. Adobe Audition is excellent at that. So you shouldn't be discouraged if you have a, a problem of that nature in your file. Now on the other hand, what you can't fix, at least not without, with, uh, without great difficulty, are obviously incomplete recordings. That's why I always check the end of my file and make sure the whole thing is there. I have received incomplete files. Another uh, strangely common problem is to get an audio file that is only one part of a two-part conversation. Uh, typically the person maybe has been interviewed over Skype by a podcast host and the way someone has set up the recording only one or the other of the parties is on the audio file. Uh, those are very strange sounding files. There'll be long periods of silence followed by an answer to a question that you didn't hear. Those are obviously completely useless files and you can't fix that. In complete files, you can still have unrecoverable problems. Uh, very bad noise, very loud machine noises in a room, uh, recordings that were made outdoors on a windy day or by an airport severe distortion, especially severe clipping. These are all things that will probably render your file unusable. So do give it a thorough listen. See if it's usable. If there are minor problems, are they fixable? And are they worth fixing? And let's assume that you've done that before we move on to the next step. There's a final thing we should discuss in terms of preparing your audio file, and that's mono versus stereo. Uh, this is a stereo file. You can see it has two channels, left and right channel. But I'm going to recommend that most of the time you should produce mono files and work with them. If you're just listening to a single person talking with a single microphone, well that's certainly a mono situation. There's no advantage to recording that as a stereo. And there are advantages to mono. A mono file will simplify your user interface because you aren't taking up screen space with two tracks. It will avoid certain problems, such as the two tracks getting out of sync or out of phase. And it will allow your file, your uh, finished product file, to render more quickly, although not much. It'll produce a smaller output file, although not much. And the smaller output file will give you faster uploads, although not much. So there are advantages to mono. And if you're not in a situation where there are advantages to stereo, then you should convert your file to mono. So when does it need to be stereo? That's the thing you need to think about. So this file that we're looking at here, this is a, a stereo file. There's two channels, left and right. Or is it a stereo file? This is the problem. Many people's workflows, many people's recording hardware produce a stereo file, even if they only have one microphone. So is this truly a stereo file where the left and right channels are different in an important way? Or is this a fake stereo file where the left and right channels are identical and were produced simply by the workflow or the recording equipment of whoever made this file? Well, let's zoom in. 
uh, come in for a closer look at these waveforms and try to figure out if the two channels are identical or different. And as we zoom in here, you can see they look pretty similar. I think this is a fake stereo file, that is, two mono files stuck in the left and right channels of a stereo file. Now there are ways to find out, uh, technical ways to verify whether these channels are identical or not. But the first thing I'd say is if they're so close that you can't tell, then the stereo probably doesn't matter very much, and I would probably change it to mono anyway. However, if you're curious, let's uh, do a technical test to see if these two files are identical. If you're the type that obsesses over this kind of thing and you've just got to know if these two channels are identical or merely similar, well, you can do that. Um, the easy way is to use the computer to compare them. And the easy way to use the computer to compare them is to subtract them. Take this upper channel, subtract this lower channel, and if they are identical, then the result should be zero. Zero in audio being a flat line. So how do you subtract two channels? Well, you can't. In addition, there is no subtract command, but you can add channels together. So if we take this channel and we negate it, which we call inverting it, and then add it to this one, that'll show us what uh, the comparison between the two channels are. So let's do that. This is a stereo file. We're going to put it into a multi-track file. So here we have a stereo file inside a multi-track session. Now I can open this file, extract the channels to mono files. I'll go back to the multi-track session. So here I have the left channel and the right channel. I will add them into the session here. Left channel, right channel. Turn the original stereo file off. So here's left and right. Now, so far these in my theory are identical. Adding them together will just make the curves larger. That won't tell us anything. What I need to do is invert this lower one. So first I'm going to open the upper one, the left channel, and save it, just so that it's saved on disk. Back to the multi-track editor. I'm going to open this one. I'm going to invert it. That inverts the phase. So every curve that was up is now down and vice versa, but it is otherwise identical. So it's just like putting a minus sign in front of the audio. I'll save this as well. Back to the multi-track view. So now my theory is that these two tracks were identical. This one is now uh, inverted to what it used to be. So if I add them together, which in Adobe Audition, Audition is called a mix down, so I'm going to play them both into a single session and we'll see what results. And what results is a flat line because those two channels were in fact identical. That was not a stereo file. So if you just got to know, that's how you can tell. Frankly, however, coming uh, back to the multi-track, come back up here to what the original file was. If it is so close to identical that you can't tell, that you felt the need to bring out the mathematics, then it can't possibly matter. So whether the file's identical or just so identical that you had to uh, you had to do math to find out, my recommendation would be clearly the stereo doesn't matter and you'd be safe going to mono with this file. So if the advice is to retain stereo only if the file is truly stereo and if the stereo is important, there were air quotes over that word important, well what's important stereo anyway? And I would give a couple of examples when retaining stereo might actually be important. The first is, uh, if you have a recording that was made with two microphones and it deliberately used the stereo field for some effect, for example, if two people are having a conversation, maybe an interview, and each one has a microphone, the file might be set up so that the uh, questioner is in the left channel in your left ear and the responder is in the right channel in your right ear. Somebody took a lot of trouble to create that stereo effect, you should probably retain it. So two microphones, substantially different audio in the two uh, in a situation such as an interview would be a reason to retain the stereo. 
Another reason to retain the stereo would be uh, a multi-mic or multi-source recording where a sound engineer has balanced the sound with great care among multiple microphones. The typical case of that would be a musical performance. A band, an orchestra, would have two, five, ten, fifty microphones and a sound engineer has put a lot of time and effort into balancing the sound and getting the right stuff in the left channel and in the right channel and you should honor his work and retain that. The final case I can imagine it's uh, something like a panel discussion. This would be more common in a podcast environment. Maybe there's a group of people sitting at a table and they've got say two microphones and the stereo field is correctly reflecting that some of them are farther away from one microphone or the other and retaining the stereo would help to retain the three-dimensional effect of the panel setup. So in cases like that uh, you might actually want to retain the stereo. In cases like that it'll be obvious in the audio file that the two channels are different in a substantial way. You know, here's an example here. This is a musical performance of uh, three guitarists recorded with three microphones and the engineer has balanced it so that one of the guitarists is primarily on the left, another on the right, and another in the center. And they've put a lot of care into creating that stereo effect. And you can see here on the waveform that the left and right channels are noticeably different. So I'd keep this as stereo and retain that effect. But if it's not one of those cases where there's a noticeable difference between the left and the right channel, then I would say the file is either not stereo at all or it's stereo that doesn't matter and I'd convert to mono. Here's how we do that. Let's convert this uh, podcast of the Perry DeAngelis conversation to mono. We'll drop it into Adobe Audition. You recall this looked like a stereo file, that is there were two channels, but we tested it and discovered there aren't two channels at all, it's uh, fake stereo. The same channel, the same mono recording has been placed in both the left and the right channel. So let's convert this to a mono file. Simple in Adobe Audition, there's a predefined effect for that. Favorites, convert to mono. Now it's a mono file. And we'll do a save as so that uh, we don't destroy our original. And I'll just put uh, dash mono in the file name. And we're done. So now we have a mono version of the file that will save us some time and space and screen real estate and really cost us nothing in terms of the quality of the audio. Now it's time to make a plan for what images and other multimedia content we will need to enhance this audio file. To do that, it is really, really handy to have a transcript of the audio. Now the good news is many podcasters and other audio producers write a transcript and then read it for their recording rather than just ad-libbing what they say. Certainly most of the podcasters I know do that. So there's a good chance that you can get a hold of the transcript file that was used to produce the audio. On screen here, for example, this is the transcript that Susan used to produce that Perry DeAngelis audio file that we're working with. So if you can get a transcript from your audio recording artist, by all means do. If you can't get a transcript, it may be possible to produce one. The software for machine transcribing audio into text is getting better all the time. And of course, it doesn't have to be perfect. All we want is a file in which we can type notes and ideas about what images go with what text. So even an imperfect transition, uh, transcription is good enough. Here's an example of using some software on the Mac called Dragon Dictate, which has a transcription capability. It's uh, transcribing here. The process takes a few minutes. The result is a uh, solid block of transcribed text not especially friendly yet, but going into it with a simple text editor and just adding a few carriage returns here and there, I was easy, able uh, quite easily to end up with uh, blocks of text that I can read and that I can drop into a word processor. 
It's not a perfect transcription by any means, but it's more than good enough to serve as the basis for planning. Finally, if you don't have a transcript, you can't get one, then listen to the audio file another time and take extensive notes on what's being said. But for now, I'm going to assume that you've been able to get your hands on a transcript. Here's what I do next. I'll open the transcript in a good word processing file. I'm using Microsoft Word here, but uh, OpenOffice works just as well, and I'm sure others do. And I'll read through the transcript and think where I'd like an image to show up and of what kind. Just reading through the text, I can have an idea of how long a given image should stay on screen. There's no point in it flashing by in a microsecond. And I can look for subjects and topics where it would make sense for the image on screen to change. And I use the annotation feature in the word processor to record notes against the text. Most word processors have this ability to comment on text or annotate it. So zooming in here, you can see I've added an annotation that says, put this kind of an image here, put that kind of an image there, and so on. And I'll spend some time in the transcript with the annotation tool, planning out what sort of images I'm looking for. Move my ideas around, make sure they're well spaced, and by looking at the text, I can have a good plan for the flow and the continuity of the messages communicated by the images. So that's the next step. Use the transcript to identify what kind of images I'm looking for. Then I'm going to go into a separate file and make myself a shopping list before I go searching for images. So for a shopping list, I use a shopping list program or any old uh, checklist or reminder system program. What I have here is a application called Omni Outliner. It's a Mac application that is wonderful for simple checklists. There are lots of others available for both platforms. And what I've done is read through my plan in the annotated transcript and make myself a shopping list for what images I need. Some images are going to be used more than once and that becomes obvious as I read the plan. So this is my actual shopping list that tells me what kind of images I need to go and find. Going and finding the images, and in some cases getting permission to use them, can take several days. So I find it's worthwhile putting this separate shopping list together. And I will now spend the hours or days that it takes to go and get all of these images. And I get them all together and in one place and edited and any other things that need to be done to them before I start the assembly of the video. So once I start the assembly of the video, I prefer not to get distracted or have to break my stride. So, create yourself a shopping list. What images do you need? Then we'll go get them. Before we start downloading a potentially large number of image files, I like to get organized. I'm working in this folder here, and I like to create some subfolders to keep myself organized, because I may end up with dozens or hundreds of content files. I have a shopping list of some 20-25 images. Some of those will need to be edited. And for some of them, I may end up finding multiple images that I think would fit the bill and want to download them all and compare them, possibly even combine them. So I'm going to end up with a lot of files, and I want to stay organized. Here's what I do inside my folder. I, I vary this every time, but something like this. Here in audio files are audio files. There's the original audio file of the podcast and the mono version that we produced. I'll close that. There's my shopping list of images needed. Now, as I find images and download them, I'm going to put them in one of these folders. I will be doing a lot of screen captures of Wikipedia pages. Those will go here. Some other web pages, those will go here. If I find just a plain image and download it, um, I'll put the image in this Images Ready folder if it's ready to use. But in many cases, images or even web pages that I find aren't ready to use, they'll need some minor editing or cleanup. So things that I download that need cleanup of some kind, I'll put in this Things I Need to Edit file. I'll edit them in Photoshop and then I'll move them into the appropriate other folder. If they're complicated enough that I want to keep a Photoshop source file of the edit because of you know multiple layers and adjustments and so on, I'll keep the source file in here, image edit source. 
And finally, I may occasionally feel the need to produce text files, uh, slides with bulleted text on them to make some point. Those will go in here. I'll create other folders as I need them, but the idea is to have a basic set of files available before I start downloading a lot of content and getting my workspace cluttered. Okay, let's actually get some images. We prefer to use Wikimedia Commons for images whenever we can, so I always look there first. Images that are in Wikimedia Commons are, by definition, freely available to use in any manner. That's the condition that the creator had to agree to in order to upload them to the site. So here, for example, I have done a search in Wikimedia Commons for Perry DeAngelis. I found several photos of Perry, so I'll download these and have them on hand for various uses. And I always download the highest resolution that's available. You can always shrink them. But if I start with a file that's too small and try to make it larger, it'll lose quality. My next favorite source of visual information is Wikipedia pages because, again, as a condition of creating the page, the author has agreed that the content can be reused for any purpose whatsoever. So if there's a Wikipedia page relevant to a topic that I'm creating, I can use the entire page or any part of it. Most Wikipedia pages and most other web pages that I may occasionally decide to use are longer than one window full on the screen. In general, however, I would recommend capturing the entire page, not just one window full. You can always display a single window full if desired, but capturing the entire page in its full height gives you the option of using other parts of it elsewhere or of presenting the entire page by starting at the top and then doing a video scroll down which has the additional advantage of producing some visual interest. Using Perry's Wikipedia page will demonstrate the easy way to capture an entire web page. You see this page is several windows long. The easy way to capture an entire web page uh, is with a wonderful plugin that's available for the Google Chrome browsers. I'm sure there's equivalents available for other browsers, but this one works really well. It's called Full Screen Page Capture. It shows up right here as this little camera icon. All you do is open a page that you're interested in, such as this Wikipedia page, click this button, and sit back and watch. And you can see what the plugin is doing is scrolling through the page, capturing a bunch of images, stitching them together, and then after a moment, it presents you with this lovely image file here, which is the web page in its entirety as a single image. Now I can save this web page ready to use or copy it and paste it into Photoshop if I feel that it needs a little bit of editing. So sometimes these images can get messed up, uh, not in this example here, but uh, on a page, for example, that has pop-up advertising. As the plugin moves from window to window, sometimes the pop-up advertising tries to pop up more than once and you get little artifacts, uh, ads showing up in strange parts of the window and so on. So in cases like that, I would copy the image, paste it into Photoshop, like so, and then use Photoshop to clean up the artifacts in the margins. The next place we can go for images, if we're still looking for anything, is any place we can get free royalty-free, copyright-free images. Just doing a Google search for that, for free images or royalty-free images or copyright-free images will produce all kinds of such sites. But warning, being royalty-free doesn't necessarily mean that the images are free. One very common thing you'll encounter is a place where you can pay a nominal amount for images, but then you don't have to pay royalties later when they're used. That's what royalty-free means. It doesn't necessarily mean that the content itself is free. If you're going to do much of this, you might want to consider subscribing to some kind of a royalty-free image service. I have one that I use. I use clipart.com, which for a moderate annual fee lets me get at both illustrative clipart and a sizable photo library with images that I'm allowed to use for any purpose royalty-free. 
Next, another way to get images that you're free to use is to make them yourself. So by all means, search your own photo library and see if you have pictures that help illustrate whatever it is you're trying to produce. If you don't have such pictures, maybe you're in a position to go and take them. If you're producing a subject that you know something about and there's a good scenario near you, pick up your camera and go take that perfect photo. You own it, so clearly you're free to use it in any way you like. Finally, for anything else, get permission. Just because you found a picture on someone's website does not mean you have permission to use it, but in my experience, a polite email to the website owner will usually produce permission, especially if you offer to link back to their site, their podcast, their business, or whatever. The one case that usually doesn't work is with professional photographers. They are in the business of selling images to make a living and are not always inclined to give them away. However, asking politely costs you nothing. There's a final kind of content I want to mention briefly. Eventually we're going to want to put some background music into this production, so where do we get the music? It's the same situation as images. There's lots of music available on the internet, but most of it is copyright protected. However, again, a Google search for royalty-free music or free music will produce things. And of course, anything you make yourself is yours to do with as you wish. A very easy way to get royalty-free music that is safe to use is the YouTube free music library, which I'm showing here. This is a moderate-sized library of music organized into various genres that you're free to use. Some require that you attribute the usage to the author in the credits of your video, and some do not carry that attribution requirement. So you can download music from here that will provide you the background music and effects that you need. Chances are the music clips are not long enough to cover the video that you're producing, but later we'll talk about how to extend it by making copies and gluing segments together. As a final note, some of the images that you download will be specific to this video that you're producing and would have no other conceivable use. However, you will gradually download a collection of images that are reusable. For example, in producing the YouTubeified audio files for the Guerrilla Skepticism project, I frequently reuse images such as the GSOW logo, a portrait of Susan, a picture of the GSOW blog page, and so on. So it's worthwhile setting up a folder structure to keep your standard and reusable content separate from the content that is associated with this specific file. That way you'll be able to find it to use it again. Now that we've collected all of our images, the chances are that quite a few of them need minor edits of one kind or another. So let's walk through a couple of edits here just to get an idea. We'll do all of these with Photoshop. First, I'm going to take this uh, screen capture from YouTube, and uh, I want to do two things with it. Let's imagine that I wanted this to fit into the video screen precisely. I want no overlap, no scrolling, so I want to trim it to size. Now, I'm going to use the crop tool to do that. That's here. And I know that the ratio needed for a 1080p video file is 16 by 9. So. Selecting that ratio means I'm getting precisely the right size here. I don't have to guess. I'll just drag the image to where I would like it. There we are. I want this top logo in. If I hit return, that is now precisely the correct ratio for the 16 by 9 uh, video frame. However, there's a second thing I need to do. Although this is the correct ratio, the file is not actually large enough. If I go into the image size here, you notice that it is only 1244 pixels wide, 700 high. Uh, 1080p is 1080 high, that's why it's called that. So I want to enlarge the file. Now I could put it in at this size and just scale it up inside Premiere Pro, the video editor. That'd work just fine. But Photoshop does a better job of enlarging images than Premiere Pro. If I do the enlargement here, the result will be much crisper and cleaner because it does a much more sophisticated job of interpolating the extra pixels that it has to add. So with the ratio locked here, I'm just going to type the uh, height of 1080 
which we get from 1080p and that will give me 1920 as the uh, width so 1920 1080 us hit ok it gets marginally larger as you can see it's very nice and clear so this is ready to embed in the graphic file i will save it out because there's so much flat color like the white here i don't want to use jpeg i'll get those crinkly artifacts i'll save it out as a tiff file and i will put it in my screen captures ready folder whoops but that's the wrong one my screen captures ready folder saving it there another type of edit that's quite common especially when doing full screen uh, full page captures off of web pages with that full page screen capture tool is to have to uh, take out artifacts of the capture process from a screenshot here's an example i have here this screenshot from a youtube search that was captured with that web capture tool we have a couple of problems with this that you can see there's junk repeated down the left hand side of the page here that's uh, just an artifact of the capture process it's this menu trying to float on the page and it's getting recaptured over and over again i don't want that stuff there i also don't particularly want this ad in my captured result um, this is going to be a timeless video and who knows how long that ad will mean anything so we're going to remove these things we'll do the ad first i'll just zoom in on this area do everything non-destructively i'm going to create a new layer called cover add I will take the eyedropper tool which uh, I can't find but shortcut I on the keyboard and pick up this background color marquee around the advertisement I'm saying option delete which will fill the marquee area with the selected foreground color advertisement gone now let's remove those strange artifacts of the capture process I'll uh, do this with a special layer remove artifacts I'm going to I for the eyedropper tool pick up this color M for the marquee tool cover that option delete cover that option delete and again and one last time and now I'll go back to a full screen so now you can see we only have the left hand menu in one place the ad is gone and we have a nice pristine web capture so I will save that save as screen captures ready YouTube burn search and I will save it as a TIFF so I can embed it without any JPEG artifacts. So these are just examples of the types of editing that we'll want to do. Run through all of your captured images and tidy them up now. Better to get them out of the way before you get into the flow of the workflow of assembling the video. I like to have everything ready before I begin that, which is, however, now the next step. Here we go. Okay, let's actually start up our video uh, project file now. We'd be using Adobe Premiere for that, which is down here. A uh, quick review. In, here in our work in progress folder, this is the mono file that's going to go in. And I have collected all the images I thought I would need. There they are. And I've also collected image screen captures of a bunch of Wikipedia pages. There they are. And I have uh, here a folder of some background music that I like and I have also a folder with common images that I'll use in this and in other uh, video conversions so we'll start up Adobe Premiere now we're going to do this right from scratch by starting the program and creating a new file but as I'll show you in a moment I don't usually do that there's a time-saving trick available but we'll start right from scratch and we're going to say we want to create a new project and we're calling it uh, demonstration of YouTubeification 
ing, and we'll put it somewhere sensible. We'll put it in the work in progress file. And the other settings are okay as their default. This is an important one. This says to use the hardware in the machine for video rendering. And if you have suitable hardware in your machine, that can make a huge difference. If you're using a low-end machine or a laptop, you may not have that option. You may have only the software only option. Everything will work just as well. It'll just take longer. So anyway, here, we're gonna click okay and create this project. So here we are in an empty project. A few settings I want to make sure are configured properly. I'll go into the uh, preferences here. This would be under the edit menu on a PC, I think. Um, make sure I have audio set so that all the channels are defaulting to mono because again, I've decided I'm gonna use mono for everything here. Make sure my hardware is set to my uh, converter for my headphones and my microphone in case I want to do a voiceover, I'm frankly not expecting to and sample rate of 48 kilohertz again if I happen to record a voiceover that's good so this is good and uh, so let's bring in the files that we need to work with I'll just move this window down a bit so that uh, or over here say so that we can see and let's take our audio file in this is the mono audio file drop that on the file uh, list there we'll bring our images in We'll bring our Wikipedia page captures in. Oh, there's a thing that was supposed to be in the common images folder. Oh, and it is. Uh, stop. I'm uh, just sorry for cleaning up in front of you here. Uh, we're going to bring the common images in. And we're going to bring the music in. Now, as you learn when you get to know Adobe Premiere, I didn't actually copy those files. This is just a pointers recording where the files are. So I haven't used up a whole lot of disk space here. So here we are, and this no doubt will get added to as we go along, but we're more or less ready to start. Now in Premiere Pro, I need a thing over here called a sequence. This is the timeline where all the editing happens. And because I want the sequence configured to have the appropriate properties to match this audio file. The easy way is to just drag this over here. Come on, there we are. And it creates a suitable sequence. Uh, it has given these tracks dull names, so I'm going to rename this to Podcast Audio. And I'll have the second track, which will be used later. I'm, this is where I'm going to put the music. I will rename it to Music. Don't need that for now. So now we have the audio in here, all set to go. Uh, if I hit play, I'll hear it, but I have it coming out on my headphones right now, so I'm not going to do that right this moment. And I have music files, images ready to go, and common images ready to go. I'm actually going to reconfigure the audio so that it will come out through the headphones. Default output, line output. I'll zoom in a bit just to demonstrate that point. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from so, the GSOW there's my project. Audio. One of the real so as a reminder, the video we're creating starts with this animation of the Skepticality logo, then some title page text, and then fades into a picture of Susan. Let's set that up. So I'm going to just move this audio out of the way for now. We'll create that effect in here. The audio won't start until after some of that animation has played. I have the Skepticality logo uh, here. I'll drag it onto the video track. Just going to move that playhead out of the way so that I'm sure I'm snapping into the very beginning of the video track. And I know through experience that I... Uh, get over there. I know through experience that I like that to be about 11 seconds long. So let's say 11 seconds, good enough. I will drag this back over and I'm going to zoom in so that I can see. So there's my 11 seconds of the Skepticality logo. 
but there's no motion yet because I haven't programmed that. So here's how we do that. Again, this is not supposed to be a course, it's just a fast taste of these things. With the logo selected, in the effect controls here is where I can control things that happen to this clip as it plays. So I'm going to say that here at the beginning, it starts out smaller, turning the scale down. Let's make it sort of infinitesimally small there. And uh, by about the four second mark, say there, I would like it to have zoomed up to larger than life and centered itself over in the corner. So I'll put keyframes here saying something needs to have happened by now. And we'll make it about, say, 250 times scale. And it will position itself there. So that will happen by this point. And then since I'm adding no further instructions, it'll stay there. Let's see that. Here's what will happen when the video starts to play. Scales up, moves over, and ends up where I told it to be. And just as it gets to that spot, about the four second mark, is when I will bring the text in for the title page. So um, I like to keep everything absurdly neat. So I'm gonna create a new folder for my text. New title default still called opening titles. It's showing me the current frame as a reference so I can see where text is going. I'm going to want a block of text here. I will set the font to Myriad Pro, which I like. And the text color is going to be white. And I will call it GSOW. Hello, GSOW update and the date, whatever that was, some date. And it's about Perry D. Angelis, etc. So this is where I would put the text. I don't remember what it was supposed to say at this point. So that has created a text block, which is not in the timeline yet. So I have to drag it over here in the timeline. I'm going to put it there. And it's going to run from there until here. Actually, I'll have it disappear just before the Skepticality logo disappears. So let's look at that effect. In comes the Skepticality logo. Text appears. And then the text will disappear. And then the logo disappears. So now I'd like the text to fade in and fade out. And the way to do that is to apply video transitions to it. Now watch the effect. Fades in and fades out. Now you can see why I moved the audio here out of the way because I want the audio to start just as the animation finishes up. So there's some slack at the beginning of the audio here that we don't need. I'm just going to trim that away by moving the end of the box over. So there's the beginning of the audio, and I want that to happen just as the Skepticality logo uh, disappears from the screen. So here's the effect we'll get. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic. And the next thing that will happen is as Susan starts talking, Susan will appear on the screen. Let's do that. Here's that picture of Susan Gerbic. We'll bring it in, place it as the next video thing that happens. And I believe in the original video I had her start out smaller and then grow. So we'll, uh, we'll come back and do that later as part of the cleanup. Now there's one little problem here. I'm going to get an abrupt transition between the Skepticality logo and Susan. Watch. Click. I don't want that. I want a nice uh, dissolve from one to the other. So in between these two videos, I'm right clicking here, apply default transition, which is a cross dissolve. So now watch what happens. Hello everyone. This is Susan Gerbic. Now we're going to pause here for a moment 
When I started up this project file and said I'm starting from scratch, I implied there was an easier way, and there is. Um, this is very common stuff. Pretty much every time I do one of these YouTubifications, for example, I have this skepticality animation at the beginning, and uh, the audio goes there, and some opening picture happens, and I want the same settings, and so on. So, in fact, what I have did some time ago is I took a project like this and saved it out as an empty project, and I used that as a template. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to close this, and instead of using this from scratch file, which I will dispose of, what I would normally do is take my template here, Skepticality template, I'll just bring it into my folder. I would rename that demo YouTubeification Perry. And I'll open this. Now, in this, I already have several things set up. Hello, come on. There we are. So what I already have set up in here is, first of all, that skepticality uh, animation is there. I already have a text block, which I will just edit and replace it with the text I want. I already have a few folders and some standard images and so on. Uh, and in fact, I've even brought in some music and just kind of an arbitrarily long music track which I have on mute right now, but that'll give me the basis for some music when I'm ready to do that. So all I have to do here is open that uh, opening text and take the text that I actually want to be in place for this video. This is why I wasn't too worried about the text last time. I've uh, copied and pasted the text here, so paste. There's the text that I want and I will uh, bring in my picture of Susan, which I see I don't have in my standard images file in my template here, so I'll fix that by adding it. Uh, it's a new picture of Susan, and it didn't find its way into my template. So my picture of Susan goes after the uh, the opening animation. I need my actual audio file. I'll put that in on the podcast audio track and I'm ready to go. So that's how I actually start these projects up. It's much faster than starting from scratch every time and especially uh, redoing that animation every time. I don't imagine I've got the audio lined up perfectly here, but just as a general concept, uh, here you can see it going, oh, let me put my transition in there between the animation and Susan. And uh, so here it goes. And in would come Susan there. And that's where I want the audio to start. So I'll just drag the audio over there and I'm all set to go. So that's how I actually start these projects, by uh, using a template that I created that gets me started and organized quickly. Just before we move on, I'd like to give you a quick uh, look at what that music is all about. I want to have some background music playing during the uh, podcast. And I've got some here. I've had it on mute. I'll just turn the mute off and play it here so you can see what it's all about. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Project. Now that's enough to see that we had a problem there, which is, uh, sounds pretty nice at first, but when Susan starts talking, you can't hear her, the music is too loud. So what we actually want to have happen is have the music start at full volume, but starting around here, say, we want the volume to begin fading, and by the time Susan starts talking, have the volume at zero, or I like it to be slightly above zero, so the music is still just audible in the background. So here's how we do that. 
we use a thing called track keyframes for volume. So you probably can't even notice it here, but there's a line running through the center of this audio graph, and that's the volume line. Center is zero. That is no volume adjustment. If I lower the line, I'm reducing the volume. If I raise the line, I'm increasing the volume. So, and I don't have to up, raise and lower the whole line. I can make shapes in it. I make shapes by using this pen tool. What I want is about there, something will begin to happen, and it'll end around there. And what I want to happen is that the volume decreases along that line. So it'll start from normal volume, it'll begin to fade, and by the time Susan starts talking, it'll be at minus 25 dB, which is uh, audible, but just barely. Let's give a listen to this and see what it's like. See it fading away. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSW like Project. One of the really interesting side effects. I will just mute this again to uh, not be distracted by it while we do the rest of the work. Now that we've got the opening set up, I'm going to bring in the majority of the images that I've decided to use and put them approximately where they go in the timeline. Let me just close the standard images folder here to declutter the screen, close the titles, I don't need that right now. And I notice in doing that, that when I restarted this project from the template, I forgot to re-import my uh, images that I'd collected for this project. So I'm just going to do that now. There are my images that are ready to use, and there are the Wikipedia pages that I captured. So I'll put this back here and I would like to be able to see my planning document now so I'm actually going to make this window a little smaller so that I can click back and forth to my planning document which is here. You remember this document that we uh, annotated with what I was planning to put where. By the way, in real life, I use two screens on my computer. So I have my planning document and any other reference material on one screen, and I have the uh, Premiere Pro window open on the other screen. The only reason I'm uh, farting around moving folders like this on this screen is just for the convenience of capturing this video. So referring to the plan, we say I wanted that picture of Susan up there at the beginning. Hello everyone, this is Susan. And then as soon as she says one of the really interesting things, I want to change to the computer of her at the com uh, picture of her at the computer. We'll let that sit there until uh, she talks about secondary notable sources. And when we get to notable sources, I'll put up the Wikipedia notability page. Let's go do those things. So here's Susan beginning to speak. Hi everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW project. One of the really, really, really think as soon as she said one, yes, as soon as she says one is when I wanted to change over to the other photo. So we'll trim this one down to here and bring in the picture of her at her computer, which I believe is this one. Let's confirm that. Nope. This one. Nope. Apparently I have forgotten to bring the picture of Susan at her computer into my file here. Um, so I'll go and get it. Move this thing over here. Susan Gerbic, there it is, that's it. Susan at her computer. And I think I brought, I forgot to bring in my Wikipedia notability page too, so I'll do that while I'm at it. Put this back. Okay. Yes, there's Susan at her computer, so we wanted to have that there. And we want to let that run until she says notability. One of the really interesting side effects of writing a Wikipedia page from scratch is that several of my editors have reported developing a great affection for the subject. We spend so many hours working on a page creation that it's easy to see them as a whole person. We try to find out most everything we can on the subject in order to be able to write a complete, comprehensive account of their life, while having to also prove using secondary notable sources that the person meets the Wikipedia. That's where the notability guidelines are mentioned. So that's when we'll put the Wikipedia notability page up. And now we will extend the time on this image to there. So they flow one to the other. 
Now mm -hmm. notice that image is scaled wrong. We're going to come back and fix that. Right now my objective is to get the images in the timeline. So what's next? We've got the notability page up. And then when she starts to say, even when we've worked on a page for someone that we disagree with, so as soon as she says even, I'm going to put up the page of someone that we disagree with. The Wikipedia notability requirements, which are tough. Even when... And the page that we decided to use for someone we disagree with is uh, this cryptozoologist person. There's his page, and we leave that sitting there until she says the internet was not a thing yet. And uh, or let's actually let's change the plan and do it here. Words printed on paper is when we're going to put up the picture. Oh, I know I found something that wasn't in my plan. I've got a lovely picture of a bunch of magazines in a magazine rack, which I'm going to put up as soon as she says words printed on paper. So let's skip ahead to that. Even when we first on pages that are on the opposite side of the scientific skepticism point, you still usually think you understand what they're thinking. They still don't know. They still don't know what you're thinking. Terrific. So I want to tell you about someone who I knew almost nothing about when I started to research and ended up with a kind of skeptic crush on. Someone who is very notable, known, but unknown. Let's go back to the late 1995. Words. There we are. So she starts talking about words on paper. And I have somewhere, uh, nope, not that. I ha oh, I know it's an image capture because it isn't a Wikipedia page. So I have a bookstore with a bunch of magazines on it. And I can't find it. There it is. Bookstore with Skeptical Inquirer. So that's going to go up there. Again, we'll scale that up, probably with a motion effect. And then when she says two friends bonded, we're going to put up the Skeptical Inquiry or Skeptical Inquirer uh, web page or Wikipedia page. Words written on paper were the norm. The internet was not a thing yet. Two friends there. So this is where we want the Skeptical Inquirer's web page to go. That is a Wikipedia page here for the Skeptical Inquirer. Next, another thing, blah, 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 and it, she says the two people were Perry DeAngelis and Stephen Novella. So she says that, we'll put that picture of the two of them in. So that's a good place to put the picture of the two of them in. Perry and Stephen. Now you get the idea. I'm not going to make you watch this whole thing. That picture has to go all the way up to there. This picture has to go all the way up to there. And so on. So I would go through my entire audio file, use the plan, and the plan tells me where each image goes on the timeline, and I will lay them all out. So eventually I have all the images more or less where they belong in the timeline. Uh, rarely does my layout of images end up exactly as the plan said. I change my mind as I go along, but it helped me to get to a, a pretty good start quickly. Now I'm going to go back through and adjust the images in various ways. Um, rarely will they be the right size. I'll need to adjust the sizes and I want to add some motion to many of them because this is a video after all. So we're going to start here. There's the picture of Susan that comes up right at the beginning. It's a fixed size image. I'm going to add a little motion to this just to make it interesting. What we're going to do is have it start a little smaller and then gradually zoom up to fill the right hand part of the screen. So I'll select that image so that the changes I make are being applied to it. Go to the beginning of that image, go into the effect controls, and we will start with the image smaller, say there. Scale position. And at the end of this clip, I would like the image to be about that big over here, like so. So this is what will happen. Hello, everyone. This is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Project. One of the really... Good. 
Next, we go to this picture of Susan with her hand on her chin staring at the computer. Uh, clearly, that's way too large. So we're going to scale it down, scale it to there, and uh, I think maybe what we'll do to, yeah, you know, we'll let it play. Let's see, we'll just record that scale and position. We'll let it play like that for a while, and then I think uh, starting at about here, add some keyframes, and what I'll do is arrange that by the end, we're going to zoom in a little more on just this part of the picture the upper part of her head over to the computer, whatever that works out to be. So I'll just come over to the end of the clip and I'll say that by the time we get here what I'd like is this. Like so. So the effect will be <laughs> as follows. One of the really interesting side effects of writing a Wikipedia page from scratch is that several of my editors have reported developing a great affection for their subject. Just speeding up. Okay, I like that. This uh, technique of taking a still photo and creating motion by moving the camera around in front of it, by the way, is called the Ken Burns effect. And if you want a refresher or detail on how to do that in Premiere, you can just look that up in YouTube. Um, and the final thing I'm going to do here, I don't like this abrupt transition from this picture of Susan to that. I'm going to put in my uh, default transition there so that I get a nice dissolve from the one to the other like this. W project. One of the really interesting... Good. Like that. Next, uh, down here, we make a sudden reference to the Wikipedia notability guidelines. It meets the Wikipedia notability requirements. There they are. So clearly we want to be able to see the title of that page. We will... Uh, Scale to the top. And we'll enlarge it till the margins just touch the edge of the window. There we go. We only have this page open for a few seconds. Let's find out how long that is. The duration of that clip is uh, is only four seconds. It's not really enough time to bother scrolling it. Um, so actually I think I will. I think what I'm going to do is scroll just a little. Uh, we'll start there and by the end we'll just move down a little so that you can see more than that opening page. We'll move down to say there. There. So the effect we'll get will be this. The Wikipedia notability requirements, which are tough. Even when we've worked on pages that are on the... So I like that. Again, I'll put my dissolve transition in there. And it'll look like this. It meets the Wikipedia notability requirements, which are tough. Even when we've worked on pages that are on the opposite side of... Okay, now we're going to a, an example page of someone that we don't agree with. Um, and it's quite a long page. I have lots of time now on this timeline. It's open for uh, 27 seconds. So this one I'll do a full scroll on. So what we're going to do is at the beginning, when this thing first appears on screen, it will be scaled so that the margins just touch the edge of the screen and the top will be there. Now we want to give people a couple of seconds to let their eyes focus before anything else happens. So we roll ahead a couple of seconds. They're on the opposite side of the scientific skepticism coin. Now we'll put a position anchor here so that we can start moving it and go to the end and scroll all the way down to the bottom of this page, which is there. And put in my default transition. So the effect will be the page will appear uh, stable for a couple of seconds and then it will slowly scroll all the way to the end and it'll get to the end just as we stop needing it. Let's look at that. We've worked on pages that are on the opposite side of the scientific skepticism coin. You still usually think you understand where their thinking went wrong and you still end up liking them. If you could sit down with them over lunch you probably would do so and the conversation would be terrific. So I want to tell you about someone who I knew almost nothing about when I started to research and ended up with a kind of skeptic crush. I don't like the fact that we're still looking at this 
cryptozoologist's page when Susan is starting to talk about getting interested in Perry. So I'm going to back up. About someone who I knew almost would be terrific. So there's the end of the actual discussion about this person. I'm going to cut the video back to there. And I'm going to put another copy of that picture of Susan in here. I think that makes more sense than continuing to scroll the picture of a pseudoscientist while we're talking about a skeptic that we've come to like. And this time I'll just scale it to fit. Put in my default transition. So now what we're going to see is this. Would do so, and the conversation would be terrific. So I want to tell you about someone who I knew almost nothing about when I started to research. I like that a lot better. Ended up with a kind of down here now we're going to get to this uh, picture of a bookstore. Five words written on paper were the norm. The internet was not a thing yet. Now clearly that needs to be a lot bigger. Plus, in case you can't see it, that's the skeptical inquirer there. So. What I want to do is zoom in on that. Let's uh, start like this and arrange that by the end we have zoomed in so that the skeptical inquirer is prominently visible. Default transition. <laughs> 1995. Words written on paper were the norm. The internet was not a thing yet. Two friends who bonded over a love of tabletop games were hanging out and one noticed that the other had an issue of skeptical... I just realized that this is where skeptical inquirer should show up, um, not back there, so we'll just use the uh, slip tool to move that boundary there. And we'll need to move these keyframes over so that the uh, zooming and scrolling happens to that new clip length. 1995. Let's try that. Words written on paper were the norm. The internet was not a thing yet. Two friends who bonded over a love of tabletop games were hanging out, and one noticed that the other had an issue of skeptical inquirer. Good. Next, we talk about Skeptical Inquirer magazine. That's here. So again, I'd like its Wikipedia page to show right from the top. We'll uh, zoom it. So it fills the margin, and we will go up to the top. And since this is only on screen for a few seconds, I don't think scrolling is of any value. Put a dissolve transition in. Magazine laying around. Turns out that both were subscribers and read it from cover to cover when each issue came out. The two people were Perry DeAngelis. Okay, so you're getting the idea now of this process. Here's a picture of Perry and Steve, and clearly it needs to be larger. And I think that uh, what we'll do is a, a zoom effect. So starting here, we'll let it start at that size and position. We'll move to the end of where it's going to appear. And by the time we're done with it, it will be scaled like this. Put in my default transition. The two people were Perry DeAngelis and Stephen Novella. Perry one day showed the back cover to Steve and said, Look at this list of skeptics. It'll go till there. Now I haven't filled in the rest of the videos here, but you get the idea. I would simply run through all of them and for uh, each image make the appropriate adjustments. Fit it on the screen. Uh, add some motion if appropriate. If it's a long Wikipedia page, for example, I might start at the top and scroll down. Um, so I'll just work through them all until I have the video sequence laid out to my satisfaction. I'm going to go away and work on that for a few minutes without forcing you to watch, and we'll be back and look at the result. Welcome back. I have finished laying out all of the uh, image files along the timeline corresponding to the audio, and I've adjusted the size and the scrolling on each one so that this is close to ready to go. We'll still have a little bit of fine-tuning to do, but you can see all the images are here, all the transitions are in place, they're all scaled, and so on. I did think as I was going through, I thought of one more thing I want to do that I thought I would postpone and show you here, 
and that is this. Just let me uh, skip ahead here. I left myself a bookmark. Marker. Marker. I think it's there. Uh, yes, it is. And I'm just going to zoom in the timeline here so you can see. So this page talks about ICU psychosis, which does not have its own Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's covered by the delirium Wikipedia page and that word right there says ICU psychosis so what I'd like to do is highlight that with a uh, yellow rectangle to draw the viewers eye to it let's just play this he later learned that he was suffering from IC so there's where I'd like it to appear you psychosis and he experienced aliens because he'd been fascinated by that culture of and I need it to go away before it starts scrolling. So say there. So how do we add a uh, little yellow rectangle over there? And the answer is uh, we do it with the title box maker. There is no drawing tool in uh, Premiere Pro. The drawing is actually part of making up a new title. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to make up a title. It's the same tool we use to make that text at the beginning. Uh, this is going to say highlight ICU. So there's my new title and it places the uh, page that is presently under the playhead there for my reference. So in here there's a drawing tool. I'm going to draw a rectangle around ICU psychosis like so. Uh, turn off the fill and instead stroke the outside of the rectangle with a yellow color. There. That should, uh, I think maybe I'll make the stroke a little larger. That, now that's good enough. That should draw the viewer's attention to the uh, text. So there's the text. I'll drop it on the timeline here where I want it to appear. And I'll take it away at this other marker where I want it to stop. And <clears throat> I'll put uh, dissolves on it. So let's watch that play. He was suffering from ICU psychosis and he experienced aliens because he'd been fascinated by that culture of UFOs. Perfect. So now we have a little highlight that appears there and that also gives you the general idea of how you can add minor annotations of various kinds to your images by stacking other things on top of them such as those text annotation blocks that can contain not only text but also simple diagrams. There are other ways to do that type of thing too, but this is simple for straightforward stuff and uh, works very well. So I'm just going to zoom out uh, and we are done. Here's all the videos. Here's the podcast audio. This is the music. It extends way beyond the end because this was just a template and I just filled it with music files. So the next thing we will do is go and trim the music to length. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do, you recall that uh, I'm just going to go back to looking at my track keyframes. You recall we put this volume change thing into the keyframe. I'm going to remove that now um, so that I'll be able to hear the music because I'm going to be working with it. And the uh, volume we will set when we go into a separate program to edit the audio in a few minutes. So now the music will be audible again. Let me just play it for a second and show that. I'll go here mid thing. So we can hear the music and that's what I need to work while I'm adjusting it. Uh, and I'll just go back to clip keyframes here. So next, you notice the music extends well beyond the end of the audio. I need it to stop at the end of the audio or a few seconds after maybe as a kind of a finishing chord thing. So let's go and find out how we're going to do that. And to facilitate that, um, first of all, clearly we don't need these things that stick out beyond the end. Now, I could just trim this back in and say there, now it ends at the end of the audio. But it'll end uh, kind of mid-bar in a way that doesn't really make any sense. Let's just play that and see what happens. I'll uh, zoom in close. Thank you. See, it just stops. That doesn't make any sense. What we need is an ending. So in order to understand how to do an ending, let's figure out where this music came from in the first place. You see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven and a shorter, uh, so eight hunks of music here. Well, what is this? Where did it come from? If we go over here, I'm just going to pull this 
file onto the timeline here where we can see it. This is actually the music that we're dealing with here. Let me start up the beginning. Oh, we recognize that. That's the beginning. And then it goes into this kind of funky repeating thing. So the way I filled out all of this timeline is I just clipped the center out of this piece of music, the, the part that isn't an obvious beginning or isn't an obvious end, and I copied and pasted it and just repeated it over and over and over again along here. Now even there you would notice a break between the two sections, except that I'm going to have the volume down at near zero, so you never notice that. So that's what filled in the music towards the end. Now I mention that because there is an ending on this piece, which you haven't heard yet. It's over here. Well that's what we'd like to end with. So all I'm going to do is drag this over and have the ending of the music happen just shortly after the ending of the talking. Let's zoom in so we can see a little better. So there... Uh, maybe I'll just trim this. That's the chord trailing off. So I'd like that last da da chord to happen just after Susan finishes talking. So I'll just pull it over to, say, about there. That should work out okay. And uh, we'll pull that over to fill in and put a transition in there so again you don't notice the uh, change. Now let's see what this sounds like as we approach the end. Now don't, don't pay attention to the fact that it's too loud. Just listen to the timing. Please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. Great. She says, thank you, you get the closing chord, and we're done. And the final thing I'm going to do while I'm here is I would like the video to hang around a second or so longer than the movie and then fade away. <laughs> Let's listen to and watch that. Watch the video. Please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. Beautiful. So all we have to do now is adjust the volume of the music. There are also a few other audio things I might like to do, and at least I'll want to check. I'll want to give a good listen to the actual podcast audio and make sure that I'm satisfied with it. Uh, it may need some noise reduction or equalization or other minor changes. And then uh, I want to adjust the volume of the music, as we said. And then I want to listen to the, uh, the blended result and make sure that the overall volume uh, is good. I want it to not exceed the limits of the hardware so there's no clipping but within those limits to be as loud as possible so that we have something we can work with. We'll do final volume normalization to a certain standard later, but we start by getting a good uniform volume. Now those are all things that you could do within Premiere Pro. It has an audio editing capability itself. Uh, for example, there's a traditional looking mixer that you can use to adjust volumes. And here in the effects folder, it has a fairly complete library of audio effects that you can add to music. So you can remove hum with a de-hummer, remove sibilant s's with a de-esser, there's a loudness radar, there's equalization. So it, it's got audio effects. But frankly, it's a little clunky. Audio editing is not Premiere's forte. Um, and the user interface isn't great, and the power isn't quite up to what you get with a proper audio editing package, which we have. Uh, and that is Adobe Audition. Uh, the only way to get Premiere Pro these days is through the Adobe Creative Cloud uh, suite. And if you've got that, then you have Audition too. So there's really no reason not to use it. So let's take this entire uh, sequence into Adobe Audition to do a tune-up on the audio. To do that, we just go into the Edit menu and say Edit in Adobe Audition. Edit what? Edit the whole sequence. And uh, it's going to call it that. I'm just going to put a suffix letter on that because I've done this a couple of times before and I don't want to get error messages about name collisions. Editing the entire sequence, I'm going to turn off the volume information because it doesn't work properly anyway in the transfer and let this go over into Adobe Audition. So we'll see Audition start up. Now this user interface will look slightly familiar because of course this is the same program that we used an hour or so ago to do our initial review of the podcast audio file. But now we're in what's called a multi-track mode. 
because we have several tracks here. Uh, here's the podcast audio track. Here's the music, which is actually a stereo track. I'm pretty sure it's not stereo music, but I'm not going to worry about that just yet. And even the video track shows here, although you can't actually see it as video. This is an audio editing program. However, as we move into the file, uh, it will show us a little preview of the video here so that we can get some idea of where we are in the file. It's not uh, high quality video. That's not what this program is for. So the first thing I want to do is I am going to adjust the volume of the music, and then I'll temporarily turn it off entirely and get it out of the way. But adjusting the volume of the music with this program is <laughs> quite elegant. Uh, what we're going to do is add what is called a uh, envelope. An envelope is like that track volume control from Premiere. So it's going to be a sequence of volume information that runs along the timeline here and tells it when to go up and down. But rather than clicking and editing it, we can actually do it in real time. What we're going to do is change this setting to write. Now write means watch me. I'm going to play the video and I'm going to use the audio mixer here and adjust the volume myself and it's going to remember what I'm doing and record that. So I'll show you what I mean. We'll start off and I'll gradually reduce the volume down to where and when I would like it. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic from the GSOW Project. And I'm going to stop there. We'll go back to the multi-track view. And you can see that what's happened here is uh, the volume has been recorded as starting at full and dropping down to whatever that level there is all by itself. It's watched what I did. So now if I play this back... Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbic Beautiful. from the GS. And we're going to do the same at the other end. Uh, for technical reasons that I won't get into, we have to change this thing to that setting called Latch. I'm going to move the playhead over near the end. So you'll know what to expect. Our secret cabal is located on... And around where she says secret cabal, I'm going to start bringing the audio back up. our GSOW YouTube account and listen to the, me interview other editors so you'll know what to expect. Our secret cabal is located on Facebook so you'll have to have an account with Facebook in order to participate. Open up the Wikipedia account and then write to me at gsowteam at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. So I've recorded a gradual rise in volume at this end. Let's listen to the ending. Media page. If you'd like to listen to those interviews, which details his life, you can find the links on Perry's Wikipedia page. If you'd like to join my GSOW team and find yourself learning about amazing people while researching them, please visit our GSOW YouTube account and listen to the, me interview other editors so you'll know what to expect. Our secret cabal is located on Facebook, so you'll have to have an account with Facebook in order to participate. Open up the Wikipedia account and then write to me at gsowteam at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training, and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. You know, I'm actually not completely happy with that. I think it ends up too loud. I'm going to just re-record that uh, and... Uh, all the settings are the same. Re-record that and not bring the volume up quite so high. So here we go doing it again. And listen to the, me interview other editors. So I'll stop at about minus expect. six. Our secret cabal is located on Facebook, so you'll have to have an account with Facebook in order to participate. Open up a Wikipedia account and then write to me at gsowteam at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training, and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. I think that is going to be a little better. 
to the interview other editors so you'll know what to expect. Our secret cabal is located on Facebook, so you'll have to have an account with Facebook in order to participate. Open up a Wikipedia account and then write to me at gsowteam at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. Good, I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to uh, shrink this music interface up, down now to small because I don't need to be dealing with it anymore. I'm going to mute it for a moment because I want to have a listen to the podcast audio and make some decisions about the quality of the audio. In order to be able to write a complete comprehensive account of their life while having to also prove using secondary notable sources. To so there are a few things that I might want to do with the audio. I just want to make this a little bigger so we can see all these lines here. These are places, uh, it's called an effects rack. These are places where I can drop in little circuits that modify the sound, uh, change the amplitude, add echoes, add equalizers and so on. And I can put in several and they're applied one after the other. Now, you have to remember this sound has already been edited at least twice. Susan may have edited it when she recorded her original file that she sent off to Skepticality, and then Skepticality has probably edited it again in producing their podcast. So you'd be surprised if it needed a lot of work at this point, and you don't want to go and edit it just because you can. So I'm not going to jump all over this, but I do notice a couple of things that I think I could improve. First of all, just let me play a, a piece again and have a listen as Susan's speaking to the words that Anytime she uses a word that has an S in it. Comprehensive account of their life, while having to also prove using secondary notable sources. That See, there's a bit of what's called a sibilant there. When she uses, says words that have an S in them, there tends to be a bit of a whistle. Psst, she sells seashells by the seashore. It's not bad, but I, I would like to see that cut down just a little bit. And that's a very common thing with uh, women's voices, by the way. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to put in a little filter called a de -esser. Now, there is one built into Adobe Audition here, which works just fine. But I'm not going to use that one. I'm going to use a separate one that I actually paid for because it has a nicer user interface and you'll be able to see what's going on. There we are. And I'm going to do a female voice. This is a fairly good and common setting. Now, what I'm going to do is just play some audio. And anytime you see this orange line across the top dip down, the person meets the Wikipedia notability requirements, which are tough. That's the filter Even when we've worked on pages removing on the opposite side of the sign. an S sound very slightly. If I set this control over here to sidechain for a moment, what you'll hear is only the S sounds that it is dampening. So you get an idea of what it's attacking. I assume you can hear that. Okay. So back to audio. That will produce just a little bit of a softening of those harsh S's. Now the other thing I want to do, and uh, we saw this when we explored the audio at the very beginning, you see the volume is pretty nicely constant across here, but there's two exceptions. Here it gets substantially louder, and here it gets a little louder. I think I'm not too worried about that one, but I'm a little worried about this. That looks like it approaches maximum volume. Let's play through that for a second, and I want you to watch the level meter here. Zero is maximum volume. Drain people's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide, shouting, Drain me! So yeah, that went about as loud as a sound can go, and I think it clipped. And uh, it, not only does it just kind of jump out of the speech in a, uh, what I think is in an inappropriate way, it actually distorts into the speakers a little bit. So I'd like to cut that down. Now I could just highlight it and reduce its volume, but you'd hear that. It would be an unnatural sound. Uh, instead, <laughs> there's a wonderful tool for doing that kind of thing. It's called a compressor. Lots of compressors available. They're very much a standard tool in audio editing. Again, there's a built-in one here in Adobe Audition. But again, I'm going to use a different one that I paid for because I like it better and because it's got a very nice user interface so you'll be able to see what's going on. So I'm going to put up this compressor. Now, the way the compressor works is I'm going to uh, tell it that any sound louder than a certain threshold, and I just happen to know from experience that that threshold is about there, um, I would like it to reduce by a factor of two. So it's not going to cut off the peaks. It's just going to make 
the excess half as high. So this will come down about half of its excess height. So this would come down to about here. And I'll just we'll listen to that and just you'll hear that it's really whoops, it's really not a noticeable thing that's happening. Drain people's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide, shouting, Drain me. <laughs> this had been hilarious. You see this orange the vampire says bar here. Work in public? And Perry later wrote that he believes that is an indication of what is and actually Perry being compressed. I've turned my threshold down a little bit to get less. Drain people's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide, shouting, Drain me. <laughs> this had been hilarious. The vampire says, Okay, so just uh, as a check, by the way, sorry, I should have moved that before. Watch the maximum peak meter here now when we get to that loud part. One psychic vampire stated she could drain people's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide, shouting, Drain me! So now our peak went just above about minus three. So it's not hitting the wall anymore and doing that distortion. So that was a nice little edit to make. Now that's all I'm going to do on this audio track. Uh, with some audio tracks, especially if they're originals and haven't already been edited, you may need to do a lot more. Specifically, especially noise suppression, maybe removing hums or clicks, uh, low pass filter maybe to reduce uh, the rumble of a, of a computer fan, a high pass filter to cut out the, the hiss of uh, wind moving. So, but I don't feel that I need to do those things on this particular file. So I'm going to make that a little smaller now. I'm going to turn the music back on, and the final thing we're going to do is here, this track, called the master track, this is kind of the output door. So these two audio files will be mixed together and then passed through this on their way out of the program. So anything that I do here applies to all the audio as the very last thing that happens to it. So what I'm going to put in here is an effect called a uh, limiter. Again, I have one with a better user interface so you can see what's going on. And this uh, has a couple of effects. The primary thing I want, I'm going to set this out ceiling to minus one. And so this, what this is doing is this is a guarantee that nothing in this audio file will exceed minus one dB of loudness. So it is going to be impossible for it to crash into the maximum audio and cause distortion. Uh, and I don't think there were any cases of that in the file, but it's nice to know that it's not going to happen. And then as I, I'm going to play this for a while, I'm going to pull this threshold down a little bit, and this acts like a, another little compressor. I'm going to pull it down until I just see some attenuation showing up on this graph here. And what that will do then is it will boost the overall average audio of the file slightly, but not letting the maximums go over this. That will be protected and so that, that'll give me a little more overall loudness and a little more uniformity in the loudness. And watch th this thing here for signs of it working. Hilarious. The vampire says, it does not work in public. And Perry later wrote that he believes that psychic couldn't drain a sink. In Perry's early 20s he used to compete in the local demolition derby, which is when participants would take junk cars into an arena and slam them into each other kind of like a large bumper car event. I want to go through that loud section there. People's minds. And Perry sprang up with his arms spread out wide shouting, Drain me! That must have been alert. So that gives me a nice uniform and slightly increased loudness for the file. So that's in the master track. Other sorts of things you might put in a master track is uh, filters to work on the stereo field, uh, widening the stereo field, things like that. But again, this file has already been edited and it doesn't need very much work. So I'm going to call this done. Let's just give it a listen from the beginning for a few seconds and get a sense of what it's like. This is Susan Gerbeck from the GSOW project. So I think that's going to do very nicely. Let's uh, send it back to Premiere Pro. So export to Adobe Premiere Pro. And these things I can all leave in their defaults, but this is important. I want it to take this multi-track audio, mix it down to a single mono file. 
which it will send back to Adobe Premiere Pro. Now that'll take a moment because it's actually doing the math now to apply all of those filters that we've set up. I like to work that way because uh, as is so common in other programs like Adobe Photoshop, this is a non-destructive way to work. I haven't changed the incoming audio files. I'm simply producing a new output file that contains the changes that I was asking for. Other ways to work will change the original files and I prefer not to do that. I don't like to throw information away. So we're just waiting for this uh, to render the audio to a form suitable for audition. I will cut this waiting time out of this video in a moment. Hmm. Or I guess I won't have to. It didn't take as long as I thought it was going to. So now we're back in Premiere Pro and it's saying I have an incoming audio file. What do you want me to do with it? What I want it to do with it is put it in a new audio track. You notice the audio tracks here are A1, A2, A3, Master. So when I click OK, now there's an A4. And you can see it has audio on it. That's our mixed file that contains, make these smaller now, that contains both the voice and the music mixed together. Now, I don't want to hear these original ones anymore, only this one. So I'll mute these. And go back to the beginning. We'll just <laughs> see how this plays. Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbeck from the GS. Pretty good. And let's go and check that the ending works the way we want. So can order to participate. Open up a Wikipedia account and then write to me at GSOW team at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. All right, I'm quite happy with that. Now it's time to actually export all of this as an MP4 video file suitable for uploading to YouTube. If this was a real production instead of an example, I would move the playhead back to the beginning and I would sit and watch the entire movie again just to make sure that everything's lined up, the sound is okay in every spot and so on. But for this example, I'm not gonna do that. We'll assume that this is good and ready to go. So to export as a movie, um, we say export media and we call up this export panel. Now there's a preset available in the panel for YouTube videos, which sets up everything pretty close to the way I like it. We're gonna make a few changes. First, we'll make sure it says entire sequence. Uh, that name that it's going to give it is okay. I would probably give it a more meaningful name in a real situation, but that's okay. A couple of settings I like to change here though. There are two settings here, this one and this one, that trade time for quality. I'm not in a hurry. I'm gonna set this to make two passes through the video, which will result in higher quality because it'll pre-analyze what it needs to know for compression. And also here, set maximum render quality. These two settings will make the video render out to the MP4 file more slowly. It'll probably take several hours, but the result will be slightly higher quality. The other thing I want to do, and I hinted at this earlier when we were in Adobe Audition, I'm going to go into Effects here, scroll all the way down, and turn on this Loudness Normalization effect. Loudness Normalization is a new emerging international standard. This is the North American standard, ATSC A85 for measuring the overall apparent loudness of a video file. And what this will do is normalize it to the accepted international standard minus 24 LUFS, loudness units full scale. So it doesn't really matter technically what those mean. What it means is it will adjust this as it exports it to precisely the correct overall loudness for publishing on the web in forums like YouTube. Uh, I don't need to configure a limiter because we did the limiting back in Adobe Audition, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's a, a harmless uh, extra safety measure. And I'll limit to uh, minus 1 dB. So that will uh, normalize the loudness to a pleasant value as it goes out. Maximum quality, entire sequence, we're all set to go. 
Now I could hit export here and wait while the rendering happens. It's going to take a couple of hours and my Adobe Premiere session will be tied up during that time, which I don't particularly want. Instead, I say Q. What it does is to send a description of this work over to a separate program called Adobe Media Encoder, which is this program here. I'm just going to hide Premiere for a moment and uh, hide edition. Yeah. So this is Media Encoder, and this is the file I just sent in. This is the queue of work. When I click play here, it's going to run through the queue. So this is doing the encoding, but my Adobe Premiere session is not tied up. This, is, this encoding is happening in a separate process. So that's just a little more convenient. And you can put more than one file in the queue. So if I was working on multiple videos, as each one was completed, I could hit Q from within Premiere Pro, and they'd end up listed here, and then Adobe Media Encoder will just crunch away through them, taking whatever amount of time it takes. Uh, here we see little thumbnails. It's showing us little snippets of the video as the encoding proceeds, just so that we get a check that, uh, oh yeah, that is the video I was expecting. So I'll let this crunch away. It'll take an hour or two. When it's done, we'll have the video file, and then we'll look at how to upload it to YouTube back then. Welcome back. I've taken the liberty of quitting out of Media Encoder. Its job is done. And uh, this ran for about two hours. And here is the video file that was produced by Media Encoder. We're going to have a look at it in a second, but first I just want to draw attention to this. Uh, 872 meg for what is what? About a five minute video. So they're quite large. Um, now if you're a uh, YouTube publisher, the size of file that you can upload to YouTube is limited at first. I don't recall what the limit is, but you can't exceed some relatively small number. I think it's like a gigabyte until you have successfully uploaded a few YouTube files to build up credibility. That's basically so people cannot create a YouTube account and then immediately upload a two hour pirated video with it. Um, so you may find that you can't upload a file of this large depending on your seniority in YouTube. If you have that limitation, then you need to either build up some seniority by uploading smaller videos for a while, or you can go back into the uh, export panel and explore some of the options that are in there uh, and produce a smaller file. Of course, a smaller file will be lower video quality, so that's a trade-off you're going to have to deal with. Now, before we go on, um, again, double check, I'm just going to hit the space bar on the Mac here to preview this video. Seems to be good. We'll skip forward a bit. Hello, we spend so many hours working on a paper ribbon worn. The New England Skeptical Society participants would take jump several days of knowing that they were listening pleasure. They had a order to participate. Open up a Wikipedia account and then write to me at gsowteam at gmail.com. Let me know you're ready to start training and please help us write the history of our amazing community. Thank you. Okay, so that seems to have worked. So let's upload to YouTube. Uh, you need to go into a browser to YouTube. I find uh, Chrome works best for this. I'm just going to move that folder over so that I can see the file at the same time. Again, this is just an artifact of the smaller screen that I'm using for recording here. So here we are. Uh, you have to be logged on to a Google account, and we're at the uh, YouTube. Here we are. We're at the YouTube homepage. So in the upper right corner is an upload button. Now in some browsers that's labeled with text, like the word upload. I'm not sure why it comes out as text in some browsers and an icon in others, but anyway, we're going to click upload. And here is the upload panel. So the upload again will take quite a while, so the first thing to do is to get it started. Uh, now when this thing hits the uh, public view after the upload is finished, I don't want it to be immediately public. I'm going to want a chance to have a look at it. Um, maybe change some of the text descriptions and so on, and I will choose when to release it to public. So I'm going to tell it I want it to upload as private. That way only I will be able to see it. And I'm going to drag the video into this upload window. So now the upload is beginning. You'll see a progress bar ticking across here. There we are, about 11 minutes this says. It's actually going to take longer than that, I think. Here you will give it the title that would be seen on YouTube and the description that would be seen on YouTube. Now this isn't a real video that I actually want published, so I'm going to give it a title 
uh, to tell people that it's a test file and that they shouldn't bother looking at it. Now again, it's still uploading. We can do some of this work while it's uploading. Another thing we can do while it's uploading is add some of the keywords that will help people discover this file if they're searching in YouTube. Uh, so we'll add Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. We'll add Perry DeAngelis. We'll add the common misspelling of his name. And we'll add uh, Novella in case anybody is searching for Steve Novella. Uh, and that's, oh, and let's sad Gerbic as well, in case anybody is searching for Susan Gerbic. And finally, uh, do I want, after this file is uploaded, do I want it to automatically be added to one of the channels that is part of this YouTube account? Now, this is the Gorilla Skepticism YouTube account, and so there's channels for various things that we publish, including a Scratch channel, which again is intended to tell people not to bother looking. All of these things can be done after the fact, after the upload finishes, but I may as well get it running now because, as you can see, the upload's going to take about 10 minutes. So I'm going to walk away and let it complete before I bother uh, uh, doing anything else, and, and at least these steps will be uh, already filled out properly when the video completes. Now, I can just leave it like this, come back in 10 minutes, and there'll be a few more things I can edit. Or I can click Done Now, and then when the upload finishes, the next step, which is YouTube processing in its back room, will go on. And that takes about another 10 minutes. So I'm going to do that as well. So now it's going to finish uploading. Then it's going to do the background processing that YouTube requires. And then I'll be in a position to come and see if there's any last fine-tuning that I want to do. So we'll come back in about 10 minutes. See you then. Hi, welcome back. About 20 minutes has passed. Uh, I was doing something else, so I don't really know how long ago the upload finished. But it uploads, then it does some background processing, and it leaves us here. So this is a preview of what the uh, video is going to look like when it's listed in YouTube. Now, you would, of course, give it a more interesting-looking title than that. There's a link you can share with your friends. Uh, but I'm going to go back, click Return to Editing here, and go back and make a few more changes to the video. And one reason I'm going to do that is apparent right here. It has chosen at random a frame out of the video that it thinks would make a good thumbnail. And considering this isn't a video about Ricky Lake, I don't really think that's a very good thumbnail. So we're going to change that, and we'll see if anything else needs to be adjusted. So I'll click Return to Editing. So there's the text I typed in. It's private. And uh, here are some suggested thumbnails. Ricky Lake, the one it's picked. Uh, Steve Novella and Perry DeAngelis, a photo of Perry. I think the Steve and Perry thing would make an excellent thumbnail, so I'm going to pick that. And I could make other changes. Maybe I've thought of some more keywords. Um, and when I'm ready, when I believe this thing is ready to go, I can change the status to unlisted, which means others can see it, but only if I email them the link, or public, which will make it visible to YouTube searches. I'm not going to do that because this is a duplicate of a demo that we've already set up. Now, one last thing. What if I wasn't satisfied with any of the thumbnails? Well, I can create my own. I can go into my photo library and find something that I think is the perfect representation of this video, uh, prepare a file, you can, somewhere in the YouTube help or easily findable with Google, at Google, it'll tell you uh, recommended file sizes, but basically it's the proportions of HD video, so anything that is sort of 16 by 9 uh, proportions. Click Custom Thumbnail and select now. And select a video that, uh, I don't know, I might pick this picture of Susan Gerbic, for example. and. Uh, select a video that, or an image that I think would be a better thumbnail. So again, I'm pretty happy with this Perry and Steven one, so I'm going to go with that. It's automatically saved itself, so I won't bother saving it. So typically what I do is ch change the status to unlisted, uh, which allows others to see it if I send them the link. Then I'd send the link to a couple of colleagues and ask them to have a look through it, make sure that uh, there isn't anything wrong that I've missed that they pick up. And then after it's got the all clear, set it to public. And that basically publishes it for the world to see. 
So that brings us to the end of the process. That's how you take an audio file, typically a podcast, uh, and make it into a YouTube file with some accompanying images to make it a little more interesting, give the uh, viewer or the listener something to look at while they're listening. Thanks for following along.